Well, hello everyone and welcome to Unleashed. I'm Carl Metzler and boy, we got a cool story to share with you. This week, it's my privilege to introduce you to Kinetic Pro Staffer, Terry James Chastain Jr., a professional dog trainer and handler from Georgia. Terry's a dog man through and through and we had the privilege to join him out west in Montana as he was training a bunch of young English pointers for the upcoming quail season. It's Pointers on the Prairie, this week on Unleashed. There are over 86 million dogs in the United States, but only a select few are considered elite working or sporting dogs. From police and military canines to hunting and sporting dogs and everything in between, meet the dogs your dog aspires to be. Get ready to see man's best friend in a whole new light. This is Unleashed. I'm Terry James Chastain Jr. I'm from Thomasville, Georgia. I'm a professional dog trainer and uh, grew up training bird dogs and retrievers and uh, take people bird hunting. Started off, you know, following dad. My dad started on Melrose Plantation in the late 70s, and he's still there today. And so I grew up with my finger in his belt loop, following him around, and you know, maybe playing hooky every now and then to go work dogs or <laughs> go to a field trial. And, you know, it's just, it was a lot of fun. And that's all I could really ever imagine doing when I grew up. Started off, you know, following dad. Um, and as I got old enough to where I could, you know, ride a horse, you know, I'd get ponied around behind somebody, you know, while they were training or, and then I got, you know, a little older and was able to ride by myself, you know, handle the horse by myself. And, and I was hooked from the beginning. And um, always knew that's what I wanted to do. My major's in aeronautical science with a minor in aviation safety and aviation business administration. I was flying, I'm type rated in the Eclipse jet. I was flying, I quit flying an Eclipse jet to go back to training bird dogs. People are like, don't you miss flying? I'm like, I mean, it's pretty neat, but it's not this. I love what I do, without a doubt. No question about it. You know, they've, uh, uh, when I started at Pine Hill, they had my resume. Um, he said, oh, it says here, you know, you're type rated in the Eclipse Jet. Yeah, I'm like, you, quit, you know, why'd you quit flying? I, said, I just love it, I couldn't stand not being behind a bird dog. And um, he said, you know, is there, you know, what are the chances that you'd ever, you know, quit training dogs? and go back to flying airplanes. And I said, as long as God keeps making walking horses and pointers, there ain't a chance. <laughs> uh, we're in East Montana uh, on the prairie, um, home on the range. <laughs> And uh, we're, our goal was to come up here and get these derbies, these young dogs started, really get them going before the fall. This year we brought 18 derbies, uh, about two, field, two you know, broke seasoned field trial dogs, uh, two hunting dogs, just in case I get the opportunity. I wanted something that wasn't gonna knock them. Uh, brought a, Handful of labs, a couple of cockers, um, and a total of uh, 29 dogs. It's about 32 hours or so, uh, 31, 32. So it's 10 to 11 hour drives, three days to get up here. 2,022 miles <laughs> to right here from the driveway. 2,022 miles from Donaldsonville to here. We got here, we were a little late this year getting here. 
And we left August 1st. We usually leave around July 25th or so. And it's now September 13th. Happy birthday, Dad. Uh, I'll call you later. Um, and we'll be here about another week. And we'll leave next week and head home. So it's been a long way. It's been a long time. We're ready to get back to the piney woods in some humidity, I guess. It's 100 degrees at home right now, so that's enough. <laughs> um, the, the cooler weather allows us to get out and run these dogs like they need to be run, you know, in the woods, which are prairie, you know, it's not really the woods. At home, you know, on a good morning, it's 78 degrees and 98% humidity before the sun comes up. And, you know, the snakes are bad. Our birds are really young, you know, quail, they will nest, you know, multiple times in a nesting season. And you really don't want to be bothering those birds at that time. It's just not good for the birds down there. Not good sending conditions for the dogs because it's hot. I mean, you'd hurt a dog pretty bad. You could hurt them quick. Up here, you know, our typical morning is, you know, in the 50s. You know, on a warm morning, we're in the low to mid 60s, but it's dry, it's not humid. We got mornings in the 40s, and that cool air will stay there for several hours so we can get up here and get good work done, you know, without the dog getting overheated. And these birds, everything comes on quick up here, it seems. You know, once that thaw happens, plants start jumping, birds start nesting. At home, if you were gonna work dogs, It'd be a hot brace, maybe get one brace of dogs in, one, one group of dogs, um, and then you're done, and you're probably not getting quality work. You're not gonna get quality work in that kind of heat. Up here, it stays cool most of the morning. I mean, it's pretty warm right now, but it was 47 degrees when we turned loose this morning, and was pretty nice up until about 10 o'clock. So we worked from, we turned loose just a few minutes after six or so, you know, it's getting the light, sun's coming up a little later now. And we worked until about 11. And it was really only that last about hour that was kind of hot. And we moved birds and, you know, the dogs were cool and safe. And we can get, we got a lot, we can get a lot done every morning up here and get a lot of dogs worked. My goal for these derbies is to get them in as many birds as I possibly can. Um, I want them to continue progressing on their pattern, their ground pattern. Um, that's a great benefit of being on the prairie. You can see really well. Uh, there's not a lot of places to hide. So you can see that dog if he's starting to go back a little bit, if he's getting too lateral, um, if he's just lining out to the front. So you can really work and hold on that pattern. That's a goal um, to get a clean, smooth ground race. We will get him in a lot of birds so we can start that breaking process. Now. The first two weeks, they're seeing they're seeing everything that things they've never seen before. The prairie, you know, lots of wind, um, bird species they've never seen. Not just game bird species, you know, other types of ground birds, songbirds, larks, different different rats and mice. There's it's a whole new world to them up here. So I let them just experience that world and take it in for the first 10 days or two weeks before I start trying to stop them. So I let them still kind of be a puppy for those first two weeks or so, because you, you don't want to ask a dog to do something that it's not really sure about to an extent. Does that make sense? You know, these dogs don't really know what these birds smell like yet. And so I don't want to start putting pressure on them until I know they know. When you watch these dogs succeed and take those steps, that's, very rewarding that's thrilling because you know I'm you know if, if that dog and that dog and that dog don't make it I'm still gonna get paid <laughs> you know what I mean but there's no you know the reward isn't in the paycheck I'm just blessed to get a paycheck for, for doing what I love and and that is watching these dogs succeed in their own ways every day and that's where the thrill comes into it Well, 
training is the word that everybody uses when they talk about progressing these dogs to making them hunting dogs or field trial dogs, but the more accurate word I believe is development. A lot of the things we're asking these dogs to do are natural instincts to do, especially if they have good genetics. Genetics are, they're the foundation of it all. And then the development of the dogs, you know, these dogs, you develop their natural instincts. They hunt. If, they, if these bird dogs, these pointers, pointers, setters, GSPs, whatever, if they existed in the wild as they are now, they would hunt. They would hunt birds, okay? So you got that going for you genetically that they're gonna do that. So one of the developmental pieces it gives them, is getting them to hunt with you. And that's, a, that's, that's the, the big foundation is getting them to go with you as, little, as a young dog. And then unlocking that drive to find a bird, you know, the point is naturally in them. So you take that, what's already in them and go, okay, now let's expand on that. And then, you know, backing, you know, or honoring, you know, that's also a natural instinct. That's a natural thing in most of these dogs. So a lot of what you're doing is just developing what's already there and molding it to what suits you and, and what you desire. Well, the pointer was, as far as bird hunting and even field trialing goes, in the late 1800s considered to be the you know, inferior of the, the two big pointing dogs at the time were pointers and English setters, okay? English setters dominated the pointing dog world for a very long time. And the people that like pointers have done a very good job at breeding and developing and bettering that breed to the point now where pointers are above and beyond the dominant pointing dog breed in you know, upland bird hunting and field trialing. They got a great nose. Yeah, they got a lot of drive, a lot of motor, and that's, you know, um, they're like a Ferrari. You know, they are high speed, low drag, and piles of style, you know, and that, that's what everybody, that's what catches, you know, they catch your eye, but in general, you know, a big, a bigger majority of the pointers, in my opinion, they've got that class, that style, that speed that you're like, man, I, I can't take my eyes off of this dog. Look at them go. They're animated while they move. Their their ground speed is super fast. Their tail's high and cracking and popping. Um, they just glide and they're graceful. Um, you, know, you just want to see more. That's that's the, I think what you know. Big picture. Why do people like pointers? It's the style, it's the speed, you know. That's why people want the, you know, the Corvette, or the Camaro over the, you know, the station wagon. Station wagon will get you there. You can put a lot of birds in the back, but man, it feels a lot cooler when you get there in a Corvette. <laughs> These dogs are some of the most athletic canines you'll ever see. Just the, the stamina alone is pretty incredible. Um, and then watching the, the pressure that they put on their body, the moves that they make at very high speed, I'm talking very high speeds, is impressive. It's hard to put into words unless you've seen it, um, how athletic they are. And some of them just hunt with reckless abandon. You know, they don't care that the cover's thick and they don't try to you know, juke through it. They just bulldoze through it. They don't care. They're looking for a bird. And nothing's going to stop them. And uh, that's what I like to see. Uh, I like to see one that hunts with reckless abandon. They don't care about their body. They just, I've had some, they just abuse themselves for the love of finding a bird. And that drive and that tenacity is what, that's what I want in a bird dog. That's what I breed for. Nutrition is you know, that's primo on the list for any athlete. And these dogs are a professional athlete. You know, when you think about these dogs that are hunting as many days as they're hunting 
and or trialing. Um, there's no other way to describe them. They are professional athlete, and they have to be fed like a professional athlete. Um, you know, you don't. You get that Corvette we talked about. You don't go put regular unleaded in it. Kinetics have had a, a very positive impact on my kennel. You know, we've created this animal that is amazing. And to give it anything, you know, less than excellent for feed is not self-serving. You know, you're really sell, you're selling the animal short because he's not gonna perform or she's not gonna perform at their best if they're not fueled and uh, nutritionally balanced. If you're not getting good food, you know, good quality proteins, good quality fats, you know, the right, you know, vitamins and minerals in there to support and rebuild these muscles as they're broken down and keep their organs functioning the best way they can, you're selling it short. You, you've got to give them the best you can if you want to get out of them the best they can, that you can get. It's always a little bit different training dogs. It keeps you kind of coming back a little bit. You start, you know, with a mama and a daddy, and you breed, and you have a litter of puppies, and you hope and pray that something they're gonna make, they're gonna make it, and you start, you know, walking them and socializing them and do all those little things and just work your way up the progression, and then all, one day you gotta find classy broke bird dog and it's very rewarding. Very frustrating along the way, but seeing them progress and grow, and it's just new every day. When you start off, you know, when you're there and they're born, you see every milestone that dog makes. You give that dog a name. You're with them every day. You see them every day. You're through every step of their training. Um, and you know, you see them more than you see your family, unfortunately. Fortunately, I have a family that loves dogs too, so uh, when the time's appropriate, they come down to the kennel and spend as much time down there with me as they can. When you spend as many days as, as you do with them, you get, you get a little bond, and um, it's hard. You can't get too attached to all of them because some of them have to get sold, and go down the line, um, but if you don't have a bond, some kind of bond with that animal and, so, and, uh, and a drive and a love for it, you'll never be as successful as you could be. It doesn't matter how hard you work at it. If you don't have a love for them and love those animals, you know, you'll never be where you could be as a dog man. I mean, that's where it really comes first, is loving these dogs. And when you spend that kind of time with them, you know, they become kind of like a family member, you know. You may not like them all the time, but you, you start to love them. You may not like them a lot of the time. There's a couple of them that drive me up the wall, um, but I feed them every day, <laughs> no matter what. When you watch these dogs succeed and take those steps, that's very rewarding, that's thrilling, because, you know, I'm, you know, if, if that dog and that dog and that dog don't make it, I'm still gonna get paid. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there's no, you know, the reward isn't in the paycheck. I'm just blessed to get a paycheck for, for doing what I love. And, and that is watching these dogs succeed in their own ways every day. And that's where the thrill comes into it, you know. Seeing that dog that just, you know, I just don't know if this sucker's gonna make it. You know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you go, oh, he's gotten a little bit better. And then that gum, is he pointed? He's pointing, look at that. And then you then you get down, you walk in front of him, you flush two pheasants, and he stands high and tall, and you shoot your gun, and you kind of like, I never thought I'd see the day, but here we are. And uh, that's where the reward comes in, and. And that's how I think that relationship and bond 
is established is, you know, you have goals for these dogs, you know, like you do for your children. And you push and you push and you push and you do everything you can to help them. And then they finally succeed. And, you know, that relationship all along grows and strengthens between you and that animal. It's pretty special. You know, there's always the, the classic line, you know, you're talking about what makes dogs so special to someone. And, you know, people say, you know, if you want to know who loves you the most, lock your wife and your dog in the trunk of a car, come back in two hours and see who's happy to see you. <laughs> you know, the unconditional love from a dog is pretty awesome. Um, and there's just something special about them that's hard to put into words uh, it's just a feeling you have in your gut and in your heart and uh, I mean, God definitely created our best friend when he created dogs you know it's always so inspiring to see the drive the passion and love for the dogs that people like Terry Chastain bring to the things they do you know there's that old saying that love what you do and you never work a day in your life well, Terry epitomizes that old saying, putting in the hard work and loving every minute of it. I hope you've been inspired by his story and maybe learned a little bit along the way. Now get outside and spend some time with your own dogs, and we'll see you next time on Unleashed.